Good afternoon, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Enrico Spolaori, I'm the chair of the economics department here at Tufts University. And uh, I'm delighted to uh, welcome all of you to this uh, really unique uh, Wellington Burnham event. So this is a uh, sort of a small conference in honor of uh, Philip Green Wright, who uh, was born here in Medford exactly 150 years to this day, on October 3rd, 1861. Uh, he uh, was a double general. He got two degrees from Tufts. In 1884, uh, he uh, pursued an accelerated master's and bachelor's degree. So he uh, got a master's from Tufts, so he was um, a fellow graduate student. So many, I can see many of our master's students here, but we just uh, upgraded and strengthened our master's program. We have a new master of science uh, in economics. And uh, I see many of these uh, master of science students right here studying uh, and they study economics and econometrics, and one of the tools that they are learning uh, was in fact invented by Philip Greenwright, who is uh, uh, really the first uh, uh, scholar who ever published uh, in uh, some uh, clear uh, sort of a, um, a, a, who published the discovery, let's say, the, the method of instrumental variables, so which is a major tool in econometrics. It is uh, uh, probably one of the most important tools, perhaps, that has been used more recently in applied, uh, uh, in applied uh, economics, in applied microeconomics, and also different fields of economics. And so we are going to celebrate uh, uh, this achievement. Now, um, is, uh, so here we have, uh, um, I will introduce uh, in uh, more detail the distinguished speakers that we have here, uh, Professor Stock from Harvard, uh, and Kay Clark from, uh, uh, from Harvard, and Josh Angrist from MIT. I uh, also have many members of the Wright family who are here, uh, and some of them, some grandchildren of Philip Green Wright, uh, will tell us uh, remembrances about their grandfather. But before uh, I go there, uh, it's a great honor also to have here the president of the university, uh, uh, President Monaco, Tony Monaco, who is also a, a prominent geneticist. And as you will learn, uh, there is a connection also with uh, uh, genetics and with the study of genetics because one of the, Philip Wright uh, also had an amazing uh, family. I mean, he was married to uh, an amazing woman, Elizabeth Wright, and also had uh, three incredible uh, children, three scholars. Um, uh, Sewell uh, was a geneticist, one of the most prominent geneticists of the, of the 20th century. Uh, Quincy was a very prominent political scientist and uh, one of the founders of the fields of international relations, and uh, Theodore Wright, who was an aeronautical engineer, one of the pioneers in the fields of aeronautical engineering. So there's also a connection with the genetics, with the field of uh, President Monaco, who, uh, as uh, you know, many of you know, uh, comes here from Oxford, he's a, a one-month-old president, he's a kind of a baby president, just, uh, <laughs> uh, and he just comes from Oxford, where um, he has uh, conducted, you know, Unbreaking research in genetics, uh, so discovering one of the uh, of the it was one of the first studies of the genes that have uh, some control over the language uh, uh, parts of the brain, and so uh, so so this uh, so not only there is a touch connection, there is also a genetics connection. So I'm introducing now uh, the, the president. Uh, unfortunately, the president cannot stay here for us for the whole event because he has to go to New York City for uh, university engagement. So after his. Um, uh, comments after his introduction, he will have to leave, but we are very honored and very grateful that he, he, he could take the time from his busy schedule to come here and uh, open this event. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. It's, it's really nice to be a baby jumbo here at, uh, at Tufts. So when I, would, I got this invitation and I, and I saw the connection with Saul Road, I had to uh, was an amazing uh, figure in, in bringing forward really the first work on um, evolutionary theory related to population genetics. And together with Fisher and Halday, they really put on a firm grounding the theoretical basis of population genetics and the whole idea of how um, genes have frequencies and how they segregate uh, in, in the population. But particularly Sewell Wright uh, was the first to, to understand the inbreeding coefficient. So siblings, on average, will share 50% of their genes. And if you go further out, you've got first cousins, and they'll share about one eighth of their genes. And I think what he figured out was, well, if you had families where first cousins were marrying, or an uncle 
these, I mean, these types of um, uh, relationships that were quite frequent enough back then and also in, in many countries uh, in today's world, you can actually calculate how the things um, transfer through pedigrees. And that's very important in, in mapping genes, particularly for genetic disorders. So he, it's really nice to be able to meet um, his daughter here and uh, understand what a significant figure his father was, also using mathematical skills for econometrics. I also found out that Tufts has quite a distinguished history in genetics, not only with relationship with Philip Greenwright and Sulwright, but I found out on Friday that um, a close friend of mine who died several years ago was the father of medical genetics, and that's Victor McCusick. He was the first to really understand the 3,000 uh, genetic disorders, which um, are very rare, and each of them can be tracked in families, and started to create a database of these. He went on to train more people in the field of medical genetics than anyone, and he did most of this work out of Johns Hopkins. He was an undergraduate here at Tufts from 1940 to 1943. He went then straight to medical school without graduating, but they did give him an honorary degree several years ago. So, as a president who um, has a genetics background, it's very nice to see what a great tradition this university has, um, not only in some of the original evolutionary theory, but also in Victor McCusick and the work that he did on medical genetics and uh, today with what we're trying to do in understanding the genetics of very common disorders, which are very frequent in the population. So it was very nice to be here. I'm sorry I can't stay for the entire event. I've got to go to a reception in New York and some bar a so thank you very much.
because it's terribly important. Uh, it is uh, a, a fundamental problem that we face in regression analysis when we have non-experimental data. In the problem that we'll focus on, or I will talk about, the interest is in estimating elasticities of demand. So elasticity of demand is uh, uh, oops, uh, written wrong here, but it's the percentage change. <laughs> this was done fairly early this morning. Um, it's the percentage change in quantity for percentage change in price. So I've written the inverse of this, is, uh, whatever. Uh, just look at this equation. <laughs> and so, uh, if you have, a, if price changes by one percent, what's the what is the quantity demand it change by? So, in a, in, you might imagine maybe it'll decrease by one percent or half a percent, and that number is the elasticity of the demand of demand. And the task is let's go ahead and try to estimate this from data. It's a number that's uh, important in a number of applications uh, and of general uh, economic. Well, the problem, uh, so, so the easiest way to think about this is if you actually have repeated data for either time series or cross-sectional data where there's a demand curve and a supply curve is shifting. So here's a standard supply and demand diagram. If um, supply is given by this uh, increasing line and demand is given by this decreasing line, then the intersection of the two will be the equilibrium value of prices and quantities that you will observe. Now, if the supply curve shifts, and this is actually an important point we will come back to later, if the supply curve shifts, but the demand curve remains constant, then what happens is that the different values of equilibrium prices will trace out the demand curve. So uh, if, if you only have shifts in the supply curve, the demand curve is traced out, and your scatter plot of data will basically trace out the demand curve, and you can estimate that by running a regression or running a straight line through either visually or using econometric methods. The identification problem arises when both supply and demand are shifting. And there's a number of different ways to look at it. Now what we would say in our modern terminology, which was introduced later than the, the rights were working on this problem, is that both prices and quantities are endogenous and that we would have simultaneous determination of supply uh, of prices and quantities by uh, shifts of both the supply curve and the demand curve. And you can see what's going to happen. If we have both the supply curve and the demand curve shifting, then, for example, in this first period, we'll have this equilibrium price right here, price and quantity right here. And in the second period, we might have this equilibrium price and quantity. The third period, we might have this equilibrium price and quantity. And what's going to happen is that prices and quantities that are going to be traced out in equilibrium by the simultaneous shifting of supply and demand are going to be a mess. Who knows what this is? You run a regression through this, you're not going to get anything in particular. You're not going to get demand, you're not going to get supply, you're going to get nothing in particular. You can go through this algebraically, and it's actually a very straightforward high school mathematics problem where you just can solve out this simultaneous system where you solve out the two variables, prices and quantities, and you can express price and quantity both in terms of the shifting, the, what shifts the supply curve and the demand curve. The supply curve could shift for a variety of reasons. For example, if it's an agricultural good, which will play an important role in our story, there could be changes in rainfall, and then in a good year you have more crops, and in a bad year you have less. The demand curve could shift because of overall economic conditions or changes in taste. But uh, those changes will occur, and as a result, both price and quantity are going to be determined by both of these shifts of supply and demand. The problem with that is, is that now price depends on, because price depends on both the demand shift and the supply shift, it means that in this regression equation here, price is going to be correlated with the error term. Well, if your right-hand variable is correlated with the error term, that means your OLS regression is going to be inconsistent. That's just a way to say, using modern terminology, the fact that we saw from this picture that you're just going to get nothing in particular out of it. Well, the solution to this, the modern solution, and the solution that we use all the time, as Professor Ingrist is going to stress, is a method called instrumental variables regression, which was, in fact, invented uh, and first displayed in the 1928 Appendix B publication by Philip Wright. The basic idea of instrumental variables regression is straightforward, and I'm going to, uh, straightforward now. 
um, and I will uh, I will I will just go through that. So here's the thing that we want to estimate, and I'm going to make a giant leap of faith that there's something or other, and that something or other is what we now call an instrument. Although back then it was called by Philip Wright an additional factor. Suppose there is some additional factor z such that it is correlated with price, or I've written here the expectation that z times p is not zero because I've deviated everything from the means. But it is uncorrelated with the error in the demand curve. If that's the case, then that means that the expectation of z times q, well, that's just equal to the expectation of z times, and I've substituted in the demand curve here. And I'm just substituting this right here, and that's a P, not a Q. So expectation of Z times P plus expectation of Z times U. And so that's beta 1 times the expectation of Z times P plus 0. And this is the first assumption of, uh, the second assumption of instrumental variables regression, which is that it's uncorrelated, the instrument is uncorrelated with the error term in the regression, in this case with the error term in the demand equation. If I divide this expectation of ZQ by the expectation of ZP, now I'm getting the second condition, or the first condition here, which is instrument relevant, so that this expectation is not zero, then I get the ratio of beta 1 being the ratio of the expectation of Z times Q over Z times P. Well, I can now take a, a sample version of this. This is an expectation based on population moments. And I can take a sample version of this and, uh, and I can substitute that in, and I'm going to have uh, the ratio of z times q over n observations divided by z times p over n observations. And that's the IV estimate. That's the instrumental variables estimator. That's the derivation. Bear this in mind. So I know many, nearly all of you have seen this, but just keep that in mind. OK. And then there's a couple of points in terms of what constitutes a valid instrument. Well, a valid instrument is going to be something that is uh, correlated with um, price, with the included endogenous regressor, and uncorrelated with uh, the error term. And in the context of an agricultural commodity, a good example of such an instrument is something that shifts the supply curve but doesn't enter demand. Well, I've already mentioned one such thing, which might be rainfall. Well, if rainfall makes crops have a better, have a better yield, then that suggests, but, but, but it doesn't affect demand, then what that says is that shifts in rainfall are going to have an effect on price, but they're not going to be related to demand because the amount of wheat that you want isn't going to depend on how rainy it is. <clears throat> and if that's the case, then that suggests that rainfall would be an exogenous, would be exogenous, that is uncorrelated with the error term, and be valid, that is correlated with price, and therefore would be a valid instrument. If you don't have a valid instrument, two things happen. Either if you don't have a relevant instrument, that is, if it's not correlated with the included endogenous regressor, then all statistical problems arise, and that's associated with what's called weak instruments. And if it's not exogenous, that is, if it actually also belongs in the demand equation, then the error OLS estimate will be inconsistent. Now, I'm going through all of this because this will come up again uh, in, uh, in, in the next talk. <clears throat> Let me turn to the history. So that's the modern textbook treatment, which would normally not have the typos. Let me go through the modern history. <clears throat> so a little bit of 19th century stuff here to, keep, to get, to get the, the stage set. Um, demand, the concept of de demand has been, had been around for quite a, quite a long time, but it really saw its, uh, its, it really came into its full fruition as an important concept in economics. And downward sloping demand curves had well stated ideas based on work of Jevons and Marshall. This 1890 site of Marshall is his Principles of Economics, which was this very important uh, book that really spread the gospel of, uh, of supply and demand and equilibrium prices and so forth. Well, because of the importance of that, the field of demand analysis really took off. And the thing that helped really have it take off was simultaneously, more or less simultaneously, there were some independent in inventions that were developed in statistics. Ordinarily, squares regression had been invented quite a while ago with a single regressor, but it wasn't really used uh, a great deal by uh, anyone in what we would think of now as the social sciences. An important contribution was Galton's 19, uh, 1877 book in which he invented the concept of regression towards the mean. 
by looking at uh, heights of uh, parents and children in Victorian England, and uh, he popularized the idea of regression. Quite interesting, quite interestingly, although people were able to estimate ordinary least squares estimators, and there's even some work on the distribution of the estimator, the concept of correlation postdated all of this work. And the first idea, the idea of correlation was first introduced by Galton in 1890, although it wasn't really mathematically precise. The first mathematically precise statement of correlation was by uh, Pearson in 1896. And so this, to give you a sense here, suppose you're standing in 1900 or 1904 and you're a young researcher, this stuff is very recent. 10, 15 years ago, you got this really great book telling you to look at demand elasticities. Pearson, there's this idea, this statistical thing of regression, and now Pearson had invented the correlation coefficient. Uh, Warren Persons, who was an assistant professor at Dartmouth, published an article in JAZA in 1910. And in this article in 1910, which I've cited here a little bit of, he, he basically goes through how you can use regression and correlation to summarize lots of economic things. And he, there's a quote here that uh, I like. The, the end, this is the end of his article in, um, in JAZA in 1910, which is to say the experience of these writers, Galton, Pearson, Ewell, Hooker, and so forth, warrants the adoption of the coefficient of correlation, this new invention, by economists as one of their standard averages. So it's a jazz article telling you to use the correlation coefficient. So that's, it gives you a I want you to think about that, about sort of this is really pretty new stuff, okay? This is, this is under, understanding even things like correlations is new. Um, so with that as a backdrop, uh, this is, the, with that as a backdrop, the young Turks, the mathematically inclined, young economists decided to go out there and to start to do a better job actually estimating demand elasticities. And this was really the first foray of econometrics into, in I think, into the world of, uh, of, of making empirical statements. And so there's some important papers. Um, I'm only going to go through one of them. Hooker, 1905, was, I think, the first person who used multiple regression and the R-squared. Now, think about this. The R-squared was first published by Pearson only about seven years earlier. So this is, you know, this is hard stuff. Uh, there's a PhD dissertation by that I haven't had the opportunity to read by Macro Crane. I mentioned this Warren Persons article where he had published a number of regressions. But the, but the really big name in this uh, field is uh, Moore. Who, uh, who published um, published uh, published a book on this in 1914? And so, uh, just to give you a sense, here's this an important paper by Henry Schultz. This is actually in the first this is the third issue of the first volume of Econometrica in 1933. And the reason I'm publishing the beginning of this is that he, in this 1933 article, goes through whom he thinks he he starts out with a literature review. So it's just like your papers. He starts out with a literature review, and his literature review says that um, uh, it was not until 1914 that the first definitive attack on the problem of deriving the elasticity of demand from statistics was made. In that year, Professor Henry L. Moore published his Economic Cycles, The Laws and Co Co uh, Causes. Okay, so, and then he went on to say that he looked at corn and hay and oats and potatoes and things like that. And then, this is a really great, uh, this is a really great, for those of your academic writers, this is a really great, or editors, this is a great literature review where he says, true, we now know that there's some people who were earlier, but more was best, so. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, okay, so here's more, more in 1914. All right, so this is the basic idea. Uh, he says that, uh, so I'm gonna skim through, I have a lot of these pictures here, or so, of, of, the, of these articles, I'm going to sort of pick out some key points. The coefficient of the elasticity of demand, therefore, is equal to dx dy. So dx dy, this is a, it should be d log x d log y. But what he's actually already done, he understands that x is actually percentage deviation from mean. So it's the so he's percentage deviated x from its mean, and that's percentage deviation in quantity, quantity and then percentage deviation in price. And he wants to evaluate that at the sample average, so he says we're going to evaluate the derivative when x is zero. Okay, so that's pretty cool. So there, so he says we want to estimate the elasticity of demand at the value uh, at the sample average of the data. And so then, what do you have to do? Well, you've got to estimate some equation. So that's what he does. He estimates an equation. He actually estimates the cubic. 
And because he plotted the data, he said, I think a cubic probably is going to fit. And so he estimated the cubic. And so there it is. And this is in percentage deviations. And then he takes the derivative. It's actually, uh, quant it's actually price on quantity. And so then what he does is he takes the derivative and evaluates it at the mean. And then he takes its reciprocal and finds an elasticity of demand for corn of uh, negative 0.92. Right? So this is 1914. And this is, this is a big deal. So he did a regression analysis. I mean, think you're doing this by hand. You want to estimate a cubic equation by hand, you better carve out some time. Okay, so this is, this is quite something. Right? This is a major contribution. Um, and to give you a sense of the mathematical sophistication of today, I'm just, he, he did some other things too. He did some Fourier analysis of rainfall and quantifying cycles. And here's just another picture from earlier in his book where he talked about the methods. So, you know, he's going through, for those of you who don't know about Fourier, Fourier coefficients, let me explain. And that's what, that's what he was doing. So this is pretty sophisticated stuff. Unfortunately, he kind of overstepped. And this has, I think, really been a downfall for his reputation, which is that his overstep was he then went on to talk about a new type of demand curve. And the new type of demand curve, after a few pages of analysis, was a demand curve for pig iron. And so what's the deal? He found the rep, they put, they found, he, okay, look at this. So, so there's his equation. He didn't do a cubic. He thought a linear one would do. There's no minus sign, okay? So the new law of demand was that it's positive elasticities. Okay, so the, okay. so what does this say? It says our representative crops and representative producers' goods exemplify types of demand curves of contrary characteristics. That is, the crops on the one hand are downward sloping, the pig iron on the other hand were demand curves are upward sloping. In the one case, as the product increases or decreases, the price falls or rises. While in the other case, the price increases with an increase of the product and falls with its decrease. So he got hammered. Okay, he just, he just got hammered. And the, that 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 this page, his page 114, this blunder was an incredibly important blunder because what it did is he got people to write some review articles of like this and think about it for a while. And so one, there's one important reference, which in terms of the history of thought, I mean, there's a, a it, it plays no role whatsoever. Uh, there was a French, a, the, a free thesis in French, which was um, uh, published but then never read uh, by a guy, Lenoir, Lenoir, who tragically was killed in the First World War shortly thereafter. And this was lost to history until about, eight, about 1970. So he actually had gone through this analysis and understood the plunder that he was that was being made by Moore, but it had uh, no impact at all in terms of any of the history of thought. The two papers that matter was a review by Philip Greenwright, published in the QJE in May of 1915, and one subsequently published by, in the Economic Journal by Leifeld in September of 1915. So these are actually just thinking back to the Economic Journal. That's a big deal journal in England. The QJE was a big deal journal in the United States. And then, so these guys basically laid out what the problem was. And then there's a, a later article get, that for a while was getting most of the credit working, but essentially working just went through what is appears in Appendix B, which is a recapitulation of, of what was in, uh, in, in, in these earlier articles. So let me go through those earlier articles, because I think it's important, although Carrie's going to talk about the invention of instrumental variables, I think it's important to understand that not only did Wright invent instrumental variables, but really he independently also invented the identification problem. He was the first person who really understood it. Well, first, I suppose you could say Lenoir was the first who really understood it, but nobody knew that he understood it. So here's the first guy that was independent, independently discovered. And Wright and Layfeld were clearly independent too because they're on different sides of the Atlantic. So this is Wright's um, long thing. So, but how about the new type, the ascending demand curve for pig iron? Is it so hopelessly irreconcilable with theory? Not at all. Oh, I actually, I actually, I, mean, I put this whole point in because I have to read this. This is like this wonderful ancient academic writing where it's sort of pretending to be polite. 
Professor Moore's studies of demand curves illustrate the principle that the need for checking statistical, statistical inductions by abstract reasoning is quite as great as that of verifying abstract reasoning by statistics. Think about it. That's a great line, right? It says, you fool. <laughs> All right, so is this irreconcilable? Is this irreconcilable with theory? Not at all. And he says, this is what's happening. What's happening is that the supply curve for pig iron is pretty much shift, pretty much stable, because it's just these, you know, I don't know what, it's just these factories that are churning out pig iron. Pig iron. But what's happening is the demand is fluctuating a lot over this time period because we're having these big business cycles, and so the demand curve is moving all over the place, and all we're doing is tracing out supply. And this is the first figure that lays this out. Pretty cool. Um, and you'll see this figure again in Appendix B, uh, 1928. And so here's, he basically then recapitulated this about 13 years later in Appendix B, but there's nothing new in Appendix B conceptually. Going, uh, here's, a, here's the same picture. Here's the picture in Appendix B that lays out both supply and demand shifting. But once you get the point, you can see what's going on. Uh, Leifeld, I love, I love this. I just, I, I love this quote uh, here. Um, so here we go. This is Leifeld's review. I have to read this. Research along these lines is not easy. So he's saying about about Moore. This is Moore. This is Leifeld's review of Moore and EJ. Research along these lines is not easy, for it requires a thorough grasp of the mathematical theory of statistics, patience to do the lengthy arithmetic. Arithmetic involved and ceaseless and acute criticism of the mathematical process in light of common sense and everything that is known about the subject matter. <laughs> Professor Moore is weak in this last hour. <laughs> he has, let us say, the artillery of mathematics and the plotting infantry of numbers, but not the aerial corps, to save them from making attacks in the wrong direction. <laughs> It's like, this is great, you know? <laughs> so he goes through it too, and he gets the he independently made, reaches the same observation. But the curve for pig iron on page 115, we saw that, is not a demand curve at all, but more nearly a supply curve. It's arrived by the intersection of irregularly fluctuating demands on supply condition. So, so, okay, so he got exactly the same thing. He didn't write the picture, but he got the same thing. Okay, so it's no one, right? EJ, QJ, that's, that's a widely understood. All right, solutions. So people said, I got it, I got it, okay, you gotta do something about this problem. There are five solutions in the 1920s, five solutions. The thing that's interesting about these five solutions is they are all recognizable research strategies today. You've been there, right? The first recognizable research strategy is to just just don't even, don't even, no, it's not even a pun. You don't even cite the articles. You just like go forth. And so a, a great example of that is a very famous book by Schultz, who was then a professor at Chicago, big shot uh, in 1928. And then that econometric article that I put up a little bit earlier in 1933. Um, I will mention also in passing, because um, Carrie's going to talk about this a little bit more, Sewell Wright also has uh, an article in 1925 on hog and corn correlations where he completely punts. Essentially, he, the way he treats price is he, he completely exogenizes, no, he, he completely exogenizes quantity. So he has price determined by quantity, and he's, but he's extremely explicit that quantity, both in his diagrams and in his treatment and in his writing, that he's just exogenizing it. He just assumes that quantity is fixed. So he just punts on this problem. Um, fortunately, Philip Wright, with his scathing tongue, did not write a review of his son's article, but he did write a review of Schultz 1928. And by this point, you could tell that P.T. Wright was getting kind of annoyed because he'd written this in 1915, and he'd written it in this appendix in 1928, and Schultz was still screwing it up. So he said, okay, you didn't get it the first time, you didn't get it the second time, I'm going to do a Monte Carlo simulation. Well, a Monte Carlo simulation back then was a real pain in the neck. So we did one draw from a Monte Carlo simulation, uh, three draws, and under three different circumstances. And so we computed the data in the case that you were tracing out supply. He computed the data for the case that you were tracing out demand. And he computed the data for the case that both of these things are happening at once. And he showed that, depending upon what's happening with these error terms, you're gonna, you can get whatever you want. Okay, so if you couldn't get it the first time or the second time, you get it the third time. 
So that's, um, but, and then, and then, oh, and then this is the killer, you can tell. So this, this is, so now the ultimate insult, the ultimate insult. But because Dr. Schultz's methods will not induce from the data the neoclassical supply, demand, and supply curves, it does not follow that no importance is to be attached to his work. You can use it for forecasting. So, so he got the fact. So on top of this, he got the fact that the reduced form, no problem. Go ahead, just you know, the, the reduced form, or just use this as a non-causal relationship, and you can use it for prediction. So this is a really great insight, actually, and that insight isn't seen elsewhere in this literature because everybody else is so obsessed with trying to get the mand elasticities in these goofy methods. Method two, this is cool, and I'm not going to talk about it at all. Except it turns out there's an entire 